my name is Calder Hendrickson, and I'm the president and founder uh, of Aqua Smart Enterprises here in Lubbock, Texas. Every time I get the opportunity to speak, I always get asked the same question. People will walk up to me, they'll get a little closer, and then they start looking up. And they're like, oh my gosh, who do you model for? Uh, they always ask, how tall are you? And I'm like, well, I'm 6'8". How short are you? <laughs> and it's funny because people are like, you're not supposed to ask me that. And I'm like, well, don't ask me how tall I am. <laughs> so then the next question is great because they go, did you play basketball? And I'm like, white man can't jump. Um, I was actually a pitcher uh, at Lubbock Christian University, which what uh, brought me to Texas from Colorado where I ended up getting a degree in ministry. Uh, so the last couple of months, I'm now getting asked the third question. People will come up to me and they'll go, how in the world did a baseball player with a degree in ministry end up on Ford's 30 under 30 list as one of the top innovators in the world in energy? I have no idea. <laughs> I do have an idea, but... Uh, hopefully today we can give you a little, little insight, but uh, my background is definitely not energy. And so this afternoon, I want to share with you a little bit more about my story and the journey that I've been on. Uh, as I am not an expert in energy, I don't have a petroleum engineering degree. Uh, however, I've had the opportunity to make a significant impact around the world. Before I share my story, let's talk about innovation. What is innovation? You know, I started thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know what? Innovation really starts with a problem, right? When you have a problem, the problem makes you think. Thinking kind of turns into ideas. Ideas turn into solutions. These solutions then turn into products and services to ultimately do what? solve the problem. So really, innovation, essentially, is value creation. What's interesting is when you start talking a lot of the PhDs in technology and innovation in several different sectors, they always talk about, we need to think outside the box. Which makes you think, can you not innovate inside the box? Of course, I'm not a scientist, so it's easy for me to say that. But it made me question, what if thinking outside the box happened inside the box? Who's played tic-tac-toe? If you haven't raised your hand, you're lying. Uh, standard game of tic-tac-toe. What you have here is a cat's game. You tie. So what do you do? Well, you start over. What if, though, in tic-tac-toe, the rules changed? What if you could take what was inside the box of tic-tac-toe and start creating boxes outside? You'd win. When you think about innovation, you hear all the time from innovators, well, Let's think, outside, let's, let's think outside the box. Because thinking outside the box is innovative, it's different, it's new. And we also think about what's inside the box as kind of standard, what exists now. So it's standard, it's existing, it's now. What if, though, you could figure out a way to take what is existing what is standard, what is now, and make it different, and make it a little bit better. I've got some great examples of companies that have done just this. The first one, Blockbuster. So you have Blockbuster that's a leader in home movie rentals for so many years. I remember as a kid, we'd go Friday, Saturday night, we'd go to Blockbuster, we'd run our movie, because that was a place you could get movies. It had significant market share. You then take vending machines. 
Okay, vending machines, we're on a university campus, vending machines are all over the place. You, you go get your pop, I'm from Colorado, so I call it pop. Um, your, your snacks, your candy bars, or whatever. What if you combine Blockbuster and vending machines together? You get Redbox. The guys that came up with Redbox took existing technologies, existing systems, and figured out a way to combine something that already exists and put them together to create value. So us, we can go in and rent a movie for cheaper, assuming you return it on time, more convenient, and it take a significant market share in a short period of time. And now, who's Blockbuster? That's innovation. The next one is, uh, if you take Zach Morris's 1990 cell phone, the five pounder, and Bill Gates's 1990s computer, what do you get? You get a smartphone. Now obviously the guy that came up with a smartphone just didn't say, oh, Eureka, I'm gonna create a gadget that can call, text, take pictures, tweet. No, they took what was inside the tic-tac-toe box and they said, you want, we can work with Zach Morris's cell phone and we can work with Bill Gates's computer, but let's create a few more boxes and all of a sudden now you have the smartphone. One of my favorites is what happens when you take Captain America and Mike Leach? Any guesses? You get our man, Cliff <laughs> Right? So, I was trying to figure out value creation here, and I was looking at our record last year, and I was like, I'm not so sure there's a whole lot of, whole lot of value creation. However, I was thinking, I bet ticket sales to females in Lubbock, Texas have skyrocketed. <laughs> that is value creation. Kind of. So you get my point. Here's companies, and I could go on and on. If you think about some of the most innovative things that have transpired, it's not something that they just created a brand new concept. Of course there is those things, but a lot of times innovation is taking things that are existing and figuring out a way to make them a little bit better. In 2010, I was in college, and I was asking the question, how do I create value for the world? What is my purpose? You know, life's really short. I'm sure all of you are asking the same question today. Why am I here? I got a degree in ministry because my heart was to impact people. So in 2010, I was finishing my degree, and I was actually at a lovely country club playing golf. And my life was about to change. I was actually out of, on the practice tee, and an older gentleman in his mid-70s came up to me, and he said, Calder, I'd like to go play nine holes of golf with you. And I was like, okay, sure. So we go play, and it's about the fourth or fifth hole. And I was like, this guy, uh, he was an innovator. He had several patents, had done very well for himself. And uh, I asked him a question. I said, if you were my age, 24 at the time, what industries would you get into? He said, oil and gas or water? I was like, well, I'm 24, I don't have money for oil and gas, so tell me more about water. <laughs> um, and so he said, come by my office next week, I wanna show you something. And I was like, okay. So I show up at his office the next week, and I walk through the door, and I duck, of course. Uh, and there's a little table in the back of his office. He said, Calder, come on in. I want to show you something. And I was like, oh, awesome, okay. He said, Calder, have you ever seen uh, sand that holds water, like a sponge? And I was like, well, we're in West Texas. I've seen plenty of sand. Uh, and I know what a sponge does, it absorbs water, but I've never seen sand that absorbs water. So he takes a cup out, just like this. And he starts pouring the sand in this cup. 
And I'm like, all right, that looks like West Texas sand that gets under my door. He takes a water bottle. And he starts pouring this water on this sand. And I was like, okay, there's a bunch of water and sand on the bottom. Sweet. What do you got for me? What are we, why are we here? And he starts taking a spoon. And he starts going like this. And he's smiling. And I was like, this guy, what, what's up with this guy? And he keeps smiling and he keeps stirring. And I'm like, just wait. I'm like, this guy might be on something. And I started looking at the cup. And I was like, holy smokes. This thing started absorbing water. And what this guy figured out was how to take sand, something that is all over the world, and figure out how to hold water. And I was like, that is awesome. So I was sold. So here's a guy that took sand that is everywhere and said, you know what, I bet if sand could hold water, we could grow food all over the world. Value creation. So I'm thinking, well, I don't have an ag background, a science background. What I knew, what was in my box, was baseball. So what I did was I introduced the technology, that cup demonstration, to the head groundskeepers of the Oakland A's, New York Yankees, and Colorado Rockies. I said, hey, I've got this stuff that holds a bunch of water. Could you use it on your fields? And they said, absolutely. Let's play with it a little bit, and we'll get back to you. I was like, oh, that sounds, sounds great. So a couple weeks later, they're like, we played with this. We've never seen anything like this before in our lives. You, you've got to go and buy this patent from this gentleman. So 24th time, I'm like, well, why not start a company? Let's go. Put together a group of investors, bought the patent, off we went, focused on sports fields. The groundskeeper then, uh, in Arizona, with the Oakland A's, said, hey, I wonder if you put this stuff on your turf, what happens? I was like, I don't know, I'll try it, but if it screws something up, uh, not my responsibility. And he kind of laughed. And he calls me several months later, he said, Calder, I put this out on my turf on one of our fields, and it saved about 66% of my water bill. And I was like, awesome, all right. We have a lawn and garden business now. So we started a lawn and garden business, and I'm thinking, wow, we could use this stuff on your front yard, your backyard. You could put it in flower beds, plants, really wherever water is being used. And if you could save you know, 50, 60% in your water, that could change a lot of things. So it kind of started in baseball and sports fields. It went to lawn and garden, and then it went to back to agriculture. It was like, okay. If you really can make sand hold water, could we grow food in places you never could grow food before? Could you grow corn in the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia with a little bit of water? And so we started an agriculture division and started working with the top uh, PhD scientists in the world regarding food production and water savings. Because they saw our technology and they like, this stuff's awesome. That turned into, hey, you know what? Hydraulic fracking in oil and gas in North America is getting really big. We're producing a lot of energy in North America. Hydraulic fracking is basically just taking sand and water and a little bit of chemistry and pumping it to high pressures down well. And they're able to basically frack open these shale formations, which allows the hydrocarbons or the energy to come back up. So I'm like, huh, I wonder if you could figure out a way, if you could have sand hold water, could you change the specific gravity of the sand particle so it basically self-suspends? What a brilliant idea. Okay. We go to the inter we go to Houston, meet with some of the largest oil and gas companies, and they're like, this is awesome. This could increase energy production. So we started an oil and gas division. The last was concrete. They use a lot of sand and a lot of water in concrete. And so we're thinking, well, what if the sand could hold water? And so we did 
some testing at the university just to see if it would work. And I'm sure it's probably hard to see this. But we basically have standard concrete that's been around for thousands of years. And what we did was we took our technology and ended up putting it in uh, the concrete. And what happened was is the technology, the coated sand would absorb free water. And then it would slowly release it back to the concrete. Or it actually increased concrete volumes by almost 10% without compromising strength properties. We started a concrete division. So we started with one patent that we purchased. A ministry degree major has written 15 to 17 other patents in three different fields from energy to, to uh, agriculture to concrete. And so I share all of this with you guys just to say this. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter if you are a science major, a ministry major, whatever you do, there's opportunity for you if you're willing to step out and be a little bit creative. Look what's inside your box right now where it might be really comfortable. And say, you know, I want to become an expert in this field step back and say, you know what, it's okay if I am an expert. If you're a PhD in microbiology, great. But how can you take what's inside your box and step back and also look and see what else is in other boxes to figure out how to create value? So my question to you today is what's inside your box? What's in your every day that if you just made a little bit better, could change the world? Thank you.